did you know that most websites that I look at have several pages or posts that don't have any internal links pointing to them? Unfortunately, including my own. Internal links can be the one of the most powerful ways that is completely under your control that you can send some link juice to certain pages. If you don't know how to see whether or not your pages have internal links pointing to them, well, my new WordPress plugin, Link Whisper, has a reports feature that shows all the posts on your website and how many internal links are pointing to those pages. And so you can just sort by those pages to see if they don't have any links at all. You might be surprised that you have pages you're trying to rank in Google for, but you haven't even built a single internal link to that particular article. So with Link Whisper, you can quickly check out the report, then you just click the Add button, and within a few seconds, checking a few boxes, you can add those internal links. It really does speed up the process. Link Whisper is in beta right now, but is going to be released very soon. In fact, as this podcast is being released, it may be available. I'm not 100% sure. So if you go over to Link Whisper, Dot com. You can either get on the wait list to be notified when it is available, or you'll see that it is ready to be purchased right there. I hope you'll check out linkwhisper.com. It's a tool that I'm really excited about. I've been using it on my own websites now for a couple of months, and it really does speed up the internal linking process. In today's episode, I have an interview with Nate Hirsch from freeup.com. So how did Nate go from being in university and then selling products through Amazon FBA to creating his own freelancer website? Well, listen to the interview to find out. Nate has a really interesting story. He built a business during college, found his partner as well, initially hired him as an employee, and their business quickly evolved from selling products on Amazon to creating a marketplace where you can go and hire a freelancer to do anything from help you with your Amazon FBA listings to now doing SEO, website design, pretty much you name it, you can find a freelancer to help you out on freeup.com. And in fact, Nate was kind enough to set up a special page for me as a Niche Pursuits listener. You can get a $50 credit if you go and sign up your first freelancer by going to freeup.com slash niche pursuits. Again, that's freeup with three E's dot com slash niche pursuits. And during the interview, listen in, we talk about why is there a third E and he'll share that story with you as well. Overall, I hope you enjoy this interview and get some actionable techniques that you can take away and apply to your own business. Hey, Nate, welcome to the Niche Pursuits podcast. Spencer, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you on. Uh, we connected just a little while ago. Actually, one of your clients that uses freeup.com uh, is really happy with the service. They reached out to me and said, hey, you've got to connect. So here we are a couple of weeks later chatting. So I'm super happy to have you on, hear about how you've grown your business, freeup.com. But before you started that business, I'm curious about your background, whether that is professional work experience or any other business experience. What were you doing before you built FreeUp? So I, I always joke that I, I've never had a real job. Growing up, my parents were both teachers, and they always had that mentality that I would go to school, get a real job, work for 30 years, retire, and that's what they did, and, and they're doing well. There's nothing wrong with that. But they always made me get these summer jobs. My By the time I was 15, legally allowed to work in Massachusetts, I was working 40, 50 hours a week while all my friends were outside playing. So I, I learned a lot about customer service and sales and how to manage people. But I also just learned how much I hated working for other people. I would watch the clock every day. I, I couldn't wait to get out of there. And it, it was almost like a glimpse into the future. So when I got to college, I kind of looked at it as a ticking clock. I had four years to create a business or I was going to go into the real world and and never look back and really not be able to get out. So when I did get to college, I started hustling right away. Freshman, sophomore year, I took that summer money that I made a few thousand dollars. 
And I started buying people's textbooks, competing with my school bookstore. Mm -hmm. I created a little referral program. And before I knew it, I had lines out the door of people trying to sell me their books to the point where I actually got a cease and desist letter from my college telling me to knock it off because I was taking too much of the bookstore business. So (laughs) that was my first glimpse into being an entrepreneur. And I I pivoted a little bit. I mean, I, I had come across Amazon. This was Back in 2008, no one really knew what Amazon was, kind of this big bookstore. And I didn't want to get kicked out of school, so I couldn't sell books anymore. And so I I kept experimenting with what I could sell. I tried video games and sporting equipment and and computers, typical college guy stuff that that I was into. And I just kept failing over and over and over. The only thing I could get to sell were these books. And it wasn't until I branched out of my comfort zone a little bit through trial and error. Keep in mind, there wasn't any of this uh, software back then that you could find profitable products and and all that. So I I got out of my comfort zone and I found baby products. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. if you can imagine me as a 20 year old single college guy selling baby products on Amazon, that was me. And I got a ton of weird looks. I would sit in the back of class just listing baby products all day. But sales took off. People love their baby products. So, I, so to to clarify, there were you uh, doing like retail arbitrage there? Yeah. So I was drop okay. shipping and I was doing retail arbitrage. Eventually, I went around the the retailers and, and made relationships right with those manufacturers. Okay. So I'm selling these baby products. I'm making more money than any 20 21 year old should make. And my parents tell me I should probably pay taxes. So I meet with an accountant. And the first question he asked me is, when are you going to hire your first person? And I kind of shrugged him off. Like, why would I do that? That's money out of my pocket. They're going to steal my ideas. They're going to hurt my business. I can do this seven days a week forever. And he just laughed in my face. (laughs) And he said, you're going to learn this lesson on your own. Sure enough, my first busy season comes around, the fourth quarter. No idea what the fourth quarter is. I'm not prepared. It's me doing everything. And I just get destroyed. I'm working 20 hours a day. My social life plummets, my grades go down, and I work my butt off to get to January. I didn't want my baby to die, my business. And I make it out to January, and I think, man, I can never let that happen again. I need to start hiring people. So I know nothing about hiring. I'm this 20-year-old punk entrepreneur, and I post a job on Facebook. (laughs) And this guy in my business law class says, I don't know what you do. Shot me a message, but I need a job. I said, you're hired. Didn't even interview him. (laughs) ends up being an amazing hire. He takes all this work off my plate. He does it at a high level. He's smart. He brings his own ideas to the table. His name's Connor Gillivan. He ends up being my business partner with my Amazon business. He's now co-owner of FreeUp. We've been working together for eight plus years. So I hit jackpot right in the beginning. So there I am thinking, man, this hiring thing is easy, right? (laughs) You post a job, someone shows up, you make your, your life becomes easier, you make more money. And I just proceed to make bad hire after bad hire after bad hire, quickly learning that college kids, not very reliable. I was not their top priority. And no 30-year-old wanted to work for me or would take me seriously as a 20-year-old entrepreneur. So that's how I got into the remote hiring space, the Upworks, the Fivers. And through my poor experiences there, I found a few good people that are still with me. But through going through a lot of bad experiences, that's when I had the idea to build my own marketplace free up, which I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about. But that's kind of how I went from a broke college kid to, to starting my Amazon business. Yeah, very cool. Thanks for sharing the story. Uh, it's really interesting to hear people that are building things while they're going to school in sort of their college dorm room there. Um, out of curiosity, what was sort of the peak earnings of your Amazon business? Yeah, I mean, I sold over $25 million on Amazon. I mean, I was wow. making hundreds of thousand dollars a year. I remember looking looking at my phone when I was at an internship. So I had two internships, one when I was in high school until my senior year of high school, and that was at the Aarons Corporation. And then I worked at Firestone senior year of high school going into college. So till about sophomore year of college. And I remember being at my internship, watching sales come in my phone and realizing I was making like 20 times well, uh, 20 times what I was making per hour at the internship just on my phone. <laughs> and then then I quit and focused 100% on Amazon. Yeah. So did you end up graduating? 
I did. I have this. Co- I know we're doing audio only, but I have this college degree behind me that I never really used. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm similar. Uh, graduated, of course. Even went to graduate school, but uh, now most of what I've learned, I've taught myself or learned online. You know, the piece of paper is nice to have, though. Uh, My parents were both teachers, so not graduating was not really an option. not an option. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so yeah, let's jump into the story of free up. So it, you gave us a little bit of the genesis of you know kind of where the idea came from. Sounds like you had bad experiences on Fiverr, probably Elance.com at the time, Upwork, uh, that sort of thing, Odesk, I think, you know, back in the day. And so you came up with the idea, maybe flesh that story out a little bit. You know, why did you really start that and decide to make it a more focused venture? Yeah. So let's put the Amazon thing in perspective. I did over $25 million a year. At our peak, we were doing over $5 million a year. So Amazon's fun. It's exciting. I'm a new entrepreneur, but Amazon's tough. Their terms of service are crazy. They're making it harder and harder. Meanwhile, on the flip side, all these gurus and courses are coming out. The Amazon space is getting more and more saturated. Dropshipping is becoming harder. Instead of doing $5 million a year, we go to to three, to two, to up to 2.5. We're kind of straggling along. We're not building a brand. We have no patents. We have no products. We're selling other people's products. We are good at it, but there, there was really nothing to build. And, and once we stopped doubling every year and all we were doing was kind of churning over and trying to, to stay on top of Amazon's policies and rule changes and, and trying to stay afloat, we were making money. We were making a good living, but the passion just wasn't there. I mean, it, it got old really fast by the time we got to year five, six, seven. So Meanwhile, we we had adventured into the remote hiring space. We had some great VAs, some great freelancers. And keep in mind with freelancers, we didn't need them all the time. During our busy season, we would hire a bunch of people. And, and after busy season was over, or especially during the summer months, which we're in now, we didn't need all these people. So we, came, we had come up with this pretty good vetting process. We had realized a long time ago that when you vet it, people just for skill, a lot of times that blows up in your face. <laughs> so we came up with this vetting process that was for skill, but it was also for attitude and communication as well. We knew the type of people that we wanted for attitude, people who are passionate, people who weren't in it just for the money, people who didn't get aggressive the second that things didn't go their way. And communication was everything when you're working with remote. I mean, people that could respond within a business day, that let you know up front when they had a personal issue, that could hit due dates, obviously spoke English at a high language. So we had this vetting process down and talking to other Amazon sellers, they, they had that same issue. It just took forever to find the right talent. If they needed a an Amazon lister or customer service rep, they needed that person today. They didn't have two weeks to wait to, to go through 50 applicants. So that was the initial concept of free up. Hey, we have this pool that we've already vetted that we're not maxing out all their hours. We're going to start offering it to, to other Amazon sellers. And the idea of free up, we started with $5,000. We had the most minimal viable product. We, we hired this developer that we used on our Amazon business to build some Amazon software to build a very basic time clock. It, the freelancers could clock in, they could clock out. The clients could see the freelancers' names and the hours on their side, and, and that was it. There was nothing else in the software. And so clients would email us what they need or message me on Facebook or, or text me, and we would introduce them to their freelancer. If they wanted to hire them, we would go in and manually add the, the freelancer to their side. And, and the initial clients, the feedback was great. They loved it. They needed a graphic designer today. Boom, they had one today. So what we did was we created a referral program. We said, hey, any clients that you refer to us, you get 50 cents for every hour that we build to them forever. And that was probably one of the best business decisions I ever made because people that love the service without us spending any money on marketing or advertising started telling other sellers. And people were talking about us within six months. I remember <laughs> I remember someone calling me and saying, hey, I was just at a conference in Japan or China and people were talking about free up <laughs> and we never even <laughs> marketed to there. So that was pretty cool. And that's really how we got it off the ground. Yeah, that's awesome. So sounds like it started more like you had several freelancers employees that you were using and you were kind of the time that they weren't using, you would kind of outsource your own people, right? Like that, the very initial set, right? Like you had graphic designers or whatever, and you would kind of allow people to use uh, them as well. Is that right? Yeah, not employees, but yeah. Yeah. And of course, it snowballed from there quite a bit. I have to ask, the name free up has three E's in it. Why? 
<laughs> so we wanted the one with two E's. Verizon owns it. We've been trying to ah. get it from them for a while. I don't think they're selling, although they don't use it for anything. But the initial thing was e-commerce. That was our focus. Uh, now we've branched into marketing. We work with nonprofits and real estate agents and all different types of business. But at first, it was free up with 30, three E's, and the third E stood for e-commerce. And it made a little bit more sense than, than it did now. But we love the idea of free up your time. Um, that, that was the best name that, that we came up with. And we really wish we got the one with two E's, but, but we're pretty happy with the three E's too. Hey, it seems to be working. You're growing a uh, large business, and uh, maybe you can convince Verizon at some point. We'll see. That, that's we'll see. that's interesting that they all uh, they own that. I noticed. Yeah, there's really nothing on the domain right now. So, so I would like to give people a sense of how well your business is doing. What can you share? I mean, if you're willing to share income numbers, people love monthly income numbers or annual, whatever, or you know, traffic or anything else that can sort of fill people in on the success of FreeUp. Yeah, we bill over $200,000 a week. So we grew that from a $5,000 investment to a million dollars in the first year, $5 million in the second, $9 million in the third. This year, who knows? I mean, a lot of our, uh, it's like e-commerce too. So part part of it is backloaded, but we're hoping to surpass $12, $13 million this year. And you say uh, that much billed, right? Correct. That's uh, top line. So, so that's top line. That's what the clients are you know, paying the, the freelancers, correct? And then you take a percentage of that? Right. We take 15% with a $2 minimum per hour and 15% on fixed prices. Okay. Sounds good. I mean, that's uh, some tremendous growth. So first of all, congrats on that. Sounds like things are going well. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. I'm, I'm excited to see how far we can push this thing. And the cool thing about us is we have no office. I mean, we're entirely remote. We we really practice what we preach. We only have we only hire virtual assistants from our platform to do all the day to day stuff. We only hire freelancers from our platform that we're just one of their many other clients to do our, our high level stuff like our, our blogs our Facebook ads, everything like that. So I'm kind of excited to see how far we can push this thing. I know some people have told me I'm crazy and I need an office and I'm going to have to hire some some full time employees in the U.S. at some point. But I want to see how far we can keep going with the, the current model. Yeah, I mean, that's great. If you can keep things virtual, obviously that cuts down on the overhead, but more so it, it allows you to have your own freedom in terms of, you know, everybody else can work their own hours. I imagine you work your own hours. And I know in my business, that's the reason I'm sort of emphasizing this. I do the same thing. Everybody's virtual. When I allow people to work sort of the hours that they want to work, you know, their sleep schedule that they want. Things get done a lot better, more effectively. And there's still, of course, that overlap where you can communicate with the people that you've hired. Yeah. And actually opening up an office was one of the, the worst business decisions I ever made. Around year four, we did that. And hmm. we took all these people that, that love being remote. We moved them to one place. We paid for a few people to relocate. And we thought that it would lead to better culture, better work environment. It actually led to more drama. I also felt like I created a, a nine to five job for myself that I had to drive into every day, which was mm -hmm. terrible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and not to mention the overhead and, and all the other expenses that go with it. So we quickly got rid of that and we've been 100% remote ever since. That's interesting that, that you tried that, that you tried opening up an office. About how long was your office open before you shut it down? A good year and a half, but we mm -hmm. had to break the lease. So it was a little longer than that. So we paid for space that we weren't even using. Yeah. So that's uh, so there you go. Um, that is an interesting lesson. You know, if uh, people are tempted to get an office, you know, maybe maybe it's worth thinking twice or uh, chatting privately with you to get uh, more details on that. Right. <laughs> exactly. And it could work with other people. I mean, I have plenty of clients who are doing way better than I am and they have an office and they kind of have a hybrid of U.S. and or U.S. employees in the office and then virtual people all over. And, and it works for them. For me, I'm kind of like you. I, I love the remote lifestyle. Yep. Absolutely. So let's dive into the, the platform itself. Why would people like me consider free up as opposed to something like Upwork? What's why would I do that? Yeah. So I tried to take everything that I liked about the other platforms and, and change everything that I didn't like. So if you go to the other platforms, you post a job, you get 50 people to apply. Anyone can offer their services there and you have to go through them and hope that you get someone good. And if you do and they quit on you later, you're, you're right back where you started interviewing people again. So with FreeUp, we get thousands of applicants every week. I think last week we got something like 2,000 applicants. So these are virtual assistants, freelancers, agencies from all over the world, five to 100 plus per hour, fixed prices to over 100 skill sets. So people are, have to apply to get in. We take the top 1%. One out of every 100 applicants get to be service providers on our platform. And clients, they don't have to browse. It's 
free to sign up. There's no monthly fee. There's no minimums. When you have an account, anytime you want someone, you click request a freelancer. It'll ask some questions so we know exactly what you need. Within a business day, usually faster, we'll introduce you to someone. You can meet with them, make sure you like them. If you like them, you can hire them. If you, if you, you can also negotiate rate or agree to fix price, whatever you want to do. If you don't like them, you can click pass and provide us feedback, and we get you someone else based on that feedback. We're fast. We have clients who get started within hours or minutes of putting in their request. And if you say, hey, send me three options, send me five options, more than happy to do it. Most people come to us because they don't want to meet 20 people. But if you want to, you're, as many as you want, we're happy to do it. On the back end, I would put our customer support against anyone out there. My calendar is right on the website. You can always book a time with me. I text every client that signs up. Uh, we also have a team of people that work underneath me that cover my Skype email, live chat 24 seven. So if you have even the smallest issue, we're always there. We want it to be hassle free. And then the back end, we know turnover is the biggest business killer. And people on our platform rarely quit. Of course, it's real life, it can happen. If it does, we cover all replacement costs. We have a no turnover guarantee and we get you a new person right away. So that's really the four ways that we're different, the, the pre-vetting, the speed, the customer service and the protection. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, Upwork is nice, but it has a lot of those limitations. You do have to vet uh, lots of people. You can get tons of applicants. It can take a lot of time. And so I guess it just becomes a matter of putting a little bit of trust into uh, the team over at FreeUp in terms of they are finding and vetting and getting the best applicant for me, which, yes, it's a small leap of faith, but it, it makes absolute sense if you pre-vetted those freelancers for us um, to, to free up that time and, uh, the ability to hire quickly. Yeah. And we're really on your side. I mean, like I said before, it's free to sign up. You're not buying a package up front. There's yep. no obligation. And it's in our best interest to get you people you actually like that help you grow your business. So obviously we want feedback. If you don't like someone we send, we're pretty good at getting it right on the first try, but if we don't tell us why, and we'll update that request and we'll make sure that the next person is a better fit. So you guys have grown quickly. Um, why do you think you've grown so quickly? What's the biggest reason for that? It's funny. For the first year and a half, we didn't spend any money on marketing. We really focused on three things. Uh, one, I mentioned our referral program. Last year, we paid out $250,000 on to our affiliates, to our referrals. And then podcasts. Podcasts have been huge. I've been on over 150 podcasts and it's been a, a quick way to not only share my story, but just get free up in front of thousands of people at once. And that's been a huge way that, that we grew our business. And then the third is influencers, whether it's people like you or Ben Cummings or Jim Cockrum, Scott Volker, people in the Amazon, the marketing communities that believe in our service, that will promote it to their students, their audience, um, their following, because they know, yes, they'll get that referral money, but they also know that if they send someone to us, we're going to take care of them. We're going to make sure that they have a good experience and building those relationships have been key. So that's been the three ways we, we got free up off the ground. Now that we're bigger, we, we have our blog that gets 10,000 views a month. We run some Facebook ads. We um, sponsor conferences and different events. But it really comes down to, to that core of getting people really good, high quality freelancers, treating them right on the customer service side, and then finding ways to, to get in front of large quantities of business owners that have probably used those other platforms and most likely not had a great experience and are willing to give us a chance. It's not like I'm selling a $5,000 package to, to sign up. The barrier to entry is really small. And when people give us a chance, they, they usually have a great experience and stick with us and hopefully tell other people. So what does your marketing team look like? I mean, is it just you and Connor, the other owner that are pretty much doing everything? Or do you have um, yeah other marketing people in place that are helping out? Yeah, we have graphic designers, we have video editors. I mean, our marketing goes a bunch of different ways. We have our YouTube, we have our, our podcast, we have our blog, uh, we have our Facebook ads, which we've actually cut back on and we're just focusing them on the freelancer side. Um, we've got people that go after influencers, so lead generation, um, people that have a following, whether it's their own blog, their own podcast, their own Facebook group. Um, and, and that's really it. So it's led by Connor and I. Connor handles a lot more behind the scenes. We we really divide and conquer on much more of the, the sales, the processes, the customer support, um, the day-to-day -day operations, the, the face. He's much more behind the scenes. Our, our website, our developers, our, our behind the scenes content. 
Um, and, and they're all virtual assistants. They're freelancers. We have mm -hmm. a VA in the Philippines who has 100,000 followers on his own YouTube channel, and he mm. runs our YouTube channel. Nice. Um, we, we have graphic designers that, uh, that are available to our clients. If you check out any of our infographics or, or like our ebook, 36 um, tips for hiring remote talent that you can get in our Facebook group, Outsourcing Masters, that was made by one of our writers and one of our graphic designers. It's our content, but they went through it and made it better. So all that stuff, we really utilize our own platform to, to build out everything that, that we need. Okay. No, that makes uh, perfect sense. So I, I can understand where you're getting uh, clients, customers, at least, you know, I understand that uh, because you're doing things like coming on my podcast, you mentioned other people, influencers, you've got a referral program. So I, I, I can understand a lot of the uh, business that's probably coming in to generate clients. How are you getting the, the freelancers, getting the word out and recruiting freelancers? What's the biggest source there? Yeah, it's very similar. I mean, we go on freelancer podcasts. We have uh, mm. freelancer influencers that we use, people that are coaches or have a follow. They might have they might have the freelancer podcast. They might have a YouTube channel, influencers in, in different ways. That same referral program that's on the client side is also on the freelancer side. If you refer a freelancer and they get through our vetting process, you make money on every hour that they bill forever. So um, the, it's really the same thing on both sides. The only difference now is we kind of cut back on our client ads um, and, and we really just target freelancers on those ads for whatever reason we found those convert better, whereas we can spend those resources that we would put into client ads into getting client influencers and lead generation. But it's, it's really the exact same thing mirrored on both sides. Uh, maybe the other difference is I don't really attend freelancer conferences, although we've sponsored a few from afar, but mostly the conferences are just on the client side. Right. I guess that makes a lot of sense. I mean, um, I have to imagine that a lot of my listeners or blog readers, um, I, I might think that they're m potentially clients, right? They're going to end up being uh, hiring freelancers. But uh, in reality, probably a lot of them wouldn't mind getting paid to write content or you know do other uh, virtual assistant type tasks. So I guess my audience is made up of probably both. And so that makes perfect sense that the uh, marketing strategy would work for both clients and virtual assistants there. Any other marketing strategies that have worked really well for you guys? Yeah, I mean, we try to share content on how people can hire better, regardless of whether they use our platform. I mean, I kind of take the approach of sales and, and marketing is it's not rah, rah, like I'm in your face. You need to use my service. Buy right now or you need to hire this. It's, hey, when you get to a point in your business where you can't scale anymore because the average $1 million a year seller or $5 million a year seller isn't a solo business owner, they usually have to have a team if you want to get to that level then there's certain strategies that, that you need to entail. I mean, for example, there, there's three different levels of people you can hire. The basic level, the, the followers, the people that are there to follow your systems, your processes, the mid-level, the doers, the graphic designers, the writers, the bookkeepers, that you're not teaching a graphic designer how to be a graphic designer, but they're not consulting with you either. And the high-level freelancers, the consultants, the agencies, the are bringing their own strategy to the table. So if we can educate people on where are you in your business? Are you stuck in the day-to-day -day operations? Are you someone who just has all these projects building up that you can't do and you need to get them off your plate? Or are you taking on something new that you could spend the next six months learning how to be a Facebook ad expert, but that's probably not a great use of your time and you can't do that with everything in your business. So let's hire an expert to come in there. So most of our marketing result revolves around content, webinars or, or Facebook lives we put on with other influencers. It's never, we never go in there with a pitch. Like you have to use free up because we're better than everyone else. It's, Hey, we believe in our service. If you use our service, we're going to treat you well, but let's teach you how to hire better and smarter because it's one of those things that they don't teach you in business school. They might teach you economics and finances and how to make a, a balance sheet, but they don't teach you how to hire and manage and, and lead people. And it's such a key to growing your business. If you can't, can't do that, it really it can be the difference between success and failure. Yeah. So maybe you can give us one of your top tips for hiring here. You do a lot of vetting and your team does a lot of vetting to get the top 1%. What are some of those telltale signs that either a potential hire is not a good fit or is a really good fit? What are some of those things that really stand out when people are looking to hire? <laughs> For me, I like to work with people that can take feedback and not take it personally. Um, that has been a, a huge thing for me. For if someone, if I 
Yeah, I'm a big fan of the feedback loop in general. I want to hear feedback, some of the best feedback, some of the best ideas, ones that have made me hundreds of thousands of dollars or saved me hundreds of thousands of dollars have come from other people. So I want to be open to that. And on the flip side, if I'm working with you, whether you're my business partner, whether you're a vendor or a virtual assistant in the Philippines, I need to be able to to give you feedback too and and have you not take it personally. It's not because I hate you. It's not because I don't want what's best with you. It's because, hey, this is what I think we should do. And it's a collaboration. And if you don't think that's right, let's talk it out and get on the same page. And for me, that's one of those things that that's a deal breaker. And sometimes, and I see this a lot with business owners, they'll they'll keep someone around because they're hitting the numbers or they're producing certain results. But that attitude just isn't there, whether it's the passion, whether it's how they talk to people, whether it it is that not being able to take feedback or, or anything along those lines. And if you don't address that, or eventually if you're not able to turn it around, remove that person from your business, you're really just sending a clear message to everyone else that you work with that attitude, that culture just doesn't matter as long as you hit the numbers. And short term, maybe that's okay. But long term, that's going to crush your business. It's going to lead to turnover. It's going to lead to people not wanting to, to work with you. And, and it's going to really hurt you. So it's one of those things that you can't look past that poor attitude. And I feel like some clients, some business owners will do that if they're getting those short term results that they want. So how do you vet for that, uh, specifically on free up? How do you uh, tell if somebody has a good attitude um, and allow them to be on your platform? Yeah. So for me, it's all about the red flags. I feel like a lot of people, I once took a college class on how to interview. It didn't teach me how to do any particular job right. It just taught me how to answer interview questions, right? How to BS them. Okay. And a lot of people go into the interviews with virtual assistants, with freelancers, with anyone, and they're looking for those right answers. For me, we're going in there and we're saying, what are the red flags? What is the person saying that tells me they don't have the skill that they say they do, that they're going to be a bad, that they're going to have a bad attitude. They're not going to have the attitude we want. They're not going to be able to communicate. So it could be something as small as challenging them in the interview process. Hey, how would you rank yourself on Amazon listings? Okay, why do you why do you think you're a seven out of ten instead of a four out of ten? Challenging people is a small example, but also a great way to see why whether someone will have a great attitude if they get defensive right away, if they challenge you back, opposed to staying calm and cool and, and explaining themselves. If you give someone feedback on their work, we already talked about not taking it personally, being able to accept that and saying, okay, we can tweak it for what you need. Those those are small examples and. While we vetted people for for skill, attitude, and communication, what we encourage clients to do, although they're welcome to do their own vetting for those three things, is to really focus on, is this person the right fit for them? Because even the best freelancer in the world isn't the best fit for every single client out there. And that's really what you have to focus on. I talk fast. I move fast. I'm very direct. I, I kind of leave emotions out when it comes to to running a business or to at least to making business decisions. So if you have me work with someone that's warm and fuzzy, that, that can't handle that speed, it's not going to work out, even if they're a great freelancer for you. So that's what I encourage clients to do is, yes, you can bet for that skill, attitude, and communication, even though we've already done it, but really focus on the type of people that you work well with, that you want to surround yourself with every day. And that's how you find that really good fit that can stick with you. Yeah. I think that's great advice. And maybe this is taking a step a little bit back, but to clarify, when you first started FreeUp, it was very focused on Amazon because that's what your business was. But what type of freelancers are available now? Uh, maybe you can just go through sort of the spectrum of the type of people we could hire on FreeUp. <laughs> Yeah, we've kind of gone through this progression. So when we started free up, we said, okay, people are going to want VAs for Amazon sellers, five to 25 bucks an hour. And then people wanted US freelancers. So we expanded it five to 50 and eventually five to 75. And Amazon sellers started telling other people in the e-commerce space. So we got Shopify store owners that would need to want Shopify stuff. Um, and then we expanded from there into the marketing community. So whether it's ClickFunnels or Facebook ads or, or agencies and marketing kind of trickles into every other business business out there. So now we have restaurant owners, we have nonprofits, we have real estate agents. So we have over a hundred skill sets on the platform. If you think of that, that breakdown I gave before of the basic, the mid and the expert, I mean, basic would be stuff like customer service and sourcing products and data entry and bookkeeping work where mid-level could be graphic designers, writers, um, social media specialists, content creators, video editors, videographers, 
And then you got the experts, whether it's account management across Amazon, eBay, Shopify, high-level web developers, UI, UX, um, any kind of marketing, whether it's Facebook ads, Google ads, stuff like that. So it, it really expands. I mean, we don't do anything illegal or against terms of service or anything like fake reviews. We, we won't honor any requests like that. But it, if it's legal we and not against terms of service, we usually have it on our platform. Yeah. So it's so quite a broad spectrum of, of things that you're providing there. Um, I think I mentioned uh, previously that I do actually plan on using your platform. I need some help with some uh, graphic design, some web design. Uh, so I'm going to give it a shot here probably in the next uh, week or two and uh, see if I can find somebody that can take care of it. You know, a small job that I have, but uh, we'll give it a shot and uh, we'll let people know how that goes for sure. I'll let you know as well. Yeah. I mean, one thing about us is we love feedback. We're, we're always asking for feedback from our partners, from our clients, even from our freelancers. I mean, we understand that the freelancers have no shortage of places they can go from the marketplaces, the Upwork Fivers to every single virtual assistant agency out there. We want to create an environment that they're not just there because the jobs are there. They're there because they want to be there. And we want to create a community. And with that comes asking for feedback. How can we make the software better? The process is better. The, the client's better. And on the client side, same thing. How can we make our message more clear? How can we make our, our content better to actually help you scale and grow your business? Obviously, the software and the systems and, and the freelancer is as well, or the quality of freelancers. So we love feedback. We understand we're a startup. Startups make mistakes, and, and we're all about trying to, to make it better and better over time to make it the go-to platform for our clients and freelancers around the world. And what year was it that you started? How many years have you been in existence now? So we started toward the end of 2015, but 2016 was the real first year. Okay. So you come a long way in three years. What are your long-term goals for the business? How big do you want to grow it? <laughs> uh, so my business partner and I are total opposites in this. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm he's a much more long-term thinker. I'm a much more short-term thinker. I remember when we started the Amazon business, he was brainstorming like five, 10 years down the line. And I was like, dude, we got stuff to do today. Let's focus <laughs> on, on that. So over the past few years, we, we've kind of reeled it in a little bit where he's a few quarters ahead and, and I'm I'm still looking months ahead. Um, so for me, in my mind, my mentality, whether it's right or wrong, is we live in a pretty amazing time. I mean, you can start a business with a laptop and some internet, but things are, are always changing. I mean, if you had told me 10 years ago, I'd be selling baby products on Amazon, wouldn't have believed you. If you had told me five years ago that I'd be running a freelancer marketplace, I probably wouldn't have believed you. So things change fast for me to, to predict the future or to set like, hey, I want to I want to sell $20 million next year. That's great, but I'm much more focused on what can we do now to get in front of more business owners, to improve the experience, to, to compete with the other players out there. And I think Connor's a lot more focused on, hey, here are our long-term goals. Mm -hmm. So nothing specific other than it sounds like you definitely like to keep growing it. You're not planning to uh, exit the business anytime soon. No, I mean, like every entrepreneur, if the right offer is there, you have to at least consider it. But I love free up. I'm passionate about it. Connor loves it. We love our team. We love our clients and the freelancers. And, and we want to see how far we can push this thing. I mean, there, there's nothing more rewarding. Last year, we paid out $7 million to freelancers around the world. And wow. people, freelancers would show me their cars and their houses. And I mean, that's awesome. Like That's yeah. way cooler than any check going into, into my bank account. Um, and, and I mean, that's kind of stuff that, that keeps you going. I think Amazon towards the end. At the end of the day, we were pushing products. Who are, who are you really helping? Like me, my team, my manufacturers, and, and that was it. And here we get to help clients pursue their dreams, their passions, their goals. We get to help freelancers grow their business and provide for their families, along with working with an amazing internal team that uh, that I love and a business partner that I, I trust. And I don't know, I feel like, how can you ask for more than that as an entrepreneur? So always open to options, never cutting anything off, but that my focus is just on growing free up right now. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's clear that uh, you're making an impact both in the lives of uh, clients and freelancers. You've got a great business and it's growing. Just any final tips or thoughts specifically for people that are looking to grow their business? Maybe they've got a little startup. Is there anything that you've applied or that we haven't talked about yet to grow free up that um, is sort of general advice that you could give to people trying to grow a business? <laughs> Yeah. So one of my, this is one of the biggest mistakes that I ever made. And it's something that I see a lot with entrepreneurs. So back in the day, I was 
pretty stressed out. I was doing a lot. There was a lot going on in my business. And I thought, man, if I could just have one person that I could teach to do everything, my life would be easier. So I hired someone. I made him what I called the manager of the day. And I taught him how to do everything, customer service, listing, repricing. Keep in mind, there wasn't software back then. And six months later, he knew everything. He was a rock star. I was sleeping better at night. And I did the same thing on the flip side. I had this one manufacturer who was doing about 85% of our sales. And I said, you know what? I don't care about the other 15%, too much of a hassle. Let's focus on this supplier that maximized their sales. So I get my business on autopilot. I am crushing it. Money's flowing in, and I think, man, I deserve a vacation. So I booked this trip to Myrtle Beach, and I will never go back. (laughs) On the first day of my vacation, I get three phone calls. The first from my manager of the day quitting on me, so six months of work down the drain. The second from my supplier telling me they no longer wanted to work with me, so starting over. And the third from my accountant telling me that someone had filed a fake tax return in my name, had stolen $40,000 from the government, and my identity was stolen, and I was going to have to deal with that mess when I came home. Ouch. Pretty rough day. Yeah. (laughs) So I I came back, and I was pretty devastated. I went from on top of the world as a young entrepreneur to let's start all over again. But I learned a very valuable lesson about diversification, and I'm very happy that I learned that in year one and two and not in year five and six. So when I came back, I started contacting lots of different suppliers and building relationships. And I think I mentioned at one point we were working with over 200 suppliers. And once we started to get sales and I could hire people again, I didn't make that same mistake. I started departmentalizing. Here's a team for customer service. Here's a team for listing. Here's a team for repricing. And it wouldn't be the last person that quit on me. But the next time someone quit on me, it wasn't that big of a deal. You plug a new customer service person back in there. It took a few weeks to get them onboarding and and you were okay. And on the flip side, it wouldn't be the last supplier that dropped us. And next time it wasn't as big of a deal. So I think a lot of entrepreneurs that they fall into that trap that hiring is hard. So they make a few bad hires and then they finally find someone they like. So they load that person up with everything. And Mm -hmm. short term, it might make you sleep better at night and it might, your business might be great, but long term, it's incredibly risky. It can set your business back months or years and it's very tough to recover from. So As you grow, as you scale, make sure you're diversifying. You don't have to go crazy. If you get 10 emails a day, you don't have to hire four customer service reps, but make sure that you're diversifying and that your business isn't relying on just one person. I think those are some great tips there. You know, unfortunately, I think I've learned a similar lesson, maybe not to the degree that uh, you had such a bad day in Myrtle Beach there, but, uh, you know, I've had some growing pains with, with hiring. And I think it makes a lot of sense if you plug people into the right position, the right role, and it's well-defined rather than really broad over the entire business. Not only uh, does it help for the very reasons you mentioned, the diversification reasons, but it also makes it very clear to the employee what their role, what their responsibility is. uh, And they can probably perform a little bit better if it's well-defined. So great tips. Um, If People want to go try FreeUp. Where should they go? Yeah. So if you go to FreeUp.com, that's FreeUp with three E's slash niche pursuits. We have a free $50 credit to try us out. Remember, it's free to sign up, no monthly fees. Make sure you use that link. You get a $50 credit to try us out. Again, my calendar is right at the top. So if you want to set up a meeting with me, more than happy to meet with you about your business, about your needs, answer any questions you have. We also have a Facebook group, Outsourcing Masters, with that free ebook that I mentioned. Come join it. We post a lot of great content, um, all about hiring, all about helping you scale. We'd love to have you in it. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty easy to contact on all social media channels. And I really appreciate you having me on. I look forward to helping your community. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Nate. It's been great to have you on the Niche Pursuits podcast. Like you said, people can go over to the freeup.com slash niche pursuits. And uh, definitely if they want to get in touch with you, sounds like it's pretty easy to find. Got a contact form uh, on the site or on social media. They can reach out and ask you any questions. So thank you, Nate, so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you.